Greetings, shippers. Welcome back. And it's time to take a look once more at Good Omens and tackle the ineffable husbands whilst examining the differences between book and series, how that is factoring into shipping, and the differences between works produced as well as modern and classic headcanons. So we have a lot to chat about. We laid the history of groundwork for this fandom as well as Gaiman's feelings on fanfiction when we discussed this fandom's renaissance, aka surge in interest thanks to the 2019 Amazon adaptation. So if you missed that, you know the drill. Click the card or the link will be down below. If you've already read more than five pages on AO3 or fully intend to, hit that like button. As always, please follow on social media to stay up to date and just come on over and chit chat about fandom. It's a good time, I swear. Also, we launched our sister channel, Casually Comics, for those looking to dip their toes into comic fandom. It's a fun time. Now onto Aziraphale and Crowley. This ship was the ship to come out of the Good Omens novel, a byproduct of many who were shipping inclined who happened to read it. Good Omens, published in 1990, is a farcical account of the apocalypse gone wrong, populated with an array of eccentric characters, two of whom are the demon Crowley and the angel Aziraphale, agents of heaven and hell respectively, sent to tip the scales to their respective sides, turning souls and the like, creating miracles and catastrophes. However, largely left unsupervised by their superiors, they end up not only coming to appreciate humans and more pointedly their inventions and hedonisms more than they should, but strike up an arrangement that has clearly blossomed into a close friendship over the 6,000 years they've been acquainted. While the two are not always in focus in the novel, what interactions they have are peppered with little hints of closeness that shippers were quick to note, latch onto, and extrapolate upon. The use of pet names, my dear and angel, the lunches, the late night drinking sessions, the gentle ribbing about their demonic or angelic natures, the small miracles Crowley performed for Aziraphale unprompted with nary a comment, the way the two would think of the other when solving a problem in a what would they think of this sense or a we discussed this. In short, within the novel, their closeness was so taken for granted that it didn't bear extra scrutiny. It was simply a fact. Add to that the human's assumptions of Aziraphale's sexuality, along with some discussion about the general sexlessness of angels, with the caveat, unless they make the effort, and many were off. While for many the relationship between Aziraphale and Crowley stood firm, what was less clear were the details of their histories. Indeed, while the book provided a firm foundation, it was sparse and minutia, so fans had room to play, and thus many trends and fanons were born. People were keen to explore the arrangement. Just what did it consist of? And what were the two like pre and post arrangement? There were many philosophical based fics, or ones playing with biblical symbolism. There was also wing fic. In our video about wing fic, we discussed how Good Omens is home to not only wing fics, but a special kind, the wingless fic. If you want to find out more about that, again, card and link. There was tons of domestic style fare, and there was smut. In fact, more so than can be found during the Renaissance at the time of this recording, for reasons we will dive into shortly. There is, of course, your standard getting together post apocalypse, or fics about as opening his bookshop. Shop. In short, the fandom filled in the gaps, creating a world rich in elements that had been hinted at but not shown, foundations laid had been jumped on. It was a small but passionate fandom, with dedicated shippers who very briefly had cause for concern when Gaiman was first asked about fanfiction and was slightly confused but decided it was alright so long as no one profited. This was the 90s, so there was much confusion as to what exactly fanfiction was, and some authors, along with their lawyers, couldn't fathom a world where these fans would create this work for free, hence felt it must be a form of intellectual theft geared towards detracting from the original work. Gaiman would eventually go on to win a Hugo Award for a fanfic, hence he clearly came to fully embrace and enjoy the subculture. Once the reason people shipped and wrote fanfic was clear to him, he quite easily saw his way to why people shipped Crowley and Aziraphale. Again, we discussed this more in depth in our first video on the subject. The Ineffable Husbands, as they came to be called, was a staple ship, meaning one that had an impact on fandom and how it developed. They were a signpost in bookdom, instrumental in modernizing wingfic, and also amassing new fans at a trickle as the book Good Omens is deemed to be a cult classic, meaning that it is always being read in some capacity. It wasn't the biggest fandom, but it certainly wasn't the smallest, and it always had a fan base just primed for something to get back to that peak. For years, that was thought to potentially be a film adaptation, but ultimately it became a series produced by Amazon. And the series ignited this fandom in a big way, and also introduced some modern fandom idiosyncrasies into the mix. Firstly, let's chat about some of the differences. There is way more of Aziraphale and Crowley in the series, and the form of multiple additional scenes, which includes a jaunt through history exploring the evolution of their relationship, and two entirely new segments in the climax and denouement, dedicated just to the fallout for their actions, and how they work together to save each other. They also speak some of the lines that were initially descriptive so that they can enter the world outside of God's narration, which is how a lot was incorporated in the book. There are some additions that cause their characterization to appear slightly different from their book counterparts. It is up for debate how different it truly is. A topic fans are working over quite vigorously, mostly good-naturedly, 
though as with all things, some will take it too far. The length of the series, contrasted to the relative shortness of the book, along with other restructured elements, allow for more of a focus on these two. This allows them to become the linchpins holding the narrative in place. The viewer also gets a better grasp of the larger stakes as played out through the threats to them and their friendship, or relationship, as many characters, from angels to random passers-by on the street, mistake them for a couple. This does occur in the novel, but nowhere near as frequently. Indeed, the personal stakes are up for everyone, but it impacts these two the most in terms of their additional scenes. The rationale is clear, to make sure people connect. A lot of the novel is abstract, or focused on pontification through the omnipotent narration. The details, while there, are sparse to the point of perfunctory, meaning how rooms look, how characters look, what a character is doing in a scene at any given moment. Sometimes it's described, and oftentimes it's not. This leaves room for extrapolation, and many feel these changes were for the better. On changes, Gaiman had some intriguing things to say, stating, There's a couple of places I took liberties, and I took some liberties in the end because I didn't want people who read the book being too cocky. So there is stuff that keeps ticking, and will keep worrying them, and a plot that does not entangle until the final second. And that was fun to build. This is part of what makes the adaptation so interesting. It is fundamentally the same, but also different. It is rare for creators to be so flexible with their work, so willing to change, though some of it had to do with the shift in medium, such as the sequence where an Aziraphale resurrects the dove rather than Crowley. Of this moment, Gaiman stated, The Good Omens fans are just obsessive in basically a very nice way, but there was a moment on the screen when you saw Aziraphale after a children's party with a dead dove in his hand, and I posted a tweet saying, Today Aziraphale will bring a dove that had been shoved up his sleeve and it died back to life. And people were like, in the book, it's Crowley who, and we were like, yeah, but we couldn't do that because we have a Bentley in the way physically, and Crowley has to get, and he's still standing, so... Another reason for some of these changes could be how much contact Gaiman has had with fandom and how strongly they feel about the depth of these two's relationship. Gaiman interacts often with his fans, even maintaining a Tumblr. Now, how fans view a work can impact how an author views it, either changing their perspective subtly or reaffirming what they felt to an impassable degree. This form of feedback loop also occurs in fan fiction, though on a much quicker and more direct scale, which coupled with a general lack of separation or pedestaling that tends to happen with published authors creates a different reader writer connection, but feedback does still happen in published works, though there is a much stronger emphasis on denying that authors can be influenced by fans, or just the public in general, despite numerous examples to the contrary. It is purely speculative, but years of talk about the depth and love between these two coupled with what is there in the text could have led to this increase in interaction, although some of it may be arising due to translation from text to screen, and also both actors did play their roles as though they loved one another, for the characters do. Or do they slightly fall in love with each other? Is this wow. a kind of love story? It's sort of a, it. Well, it's a it's a it's a buddy uh, story. Yeah. Isn't it? But they've they, no one knows what it's like to be them. They've been on Earth all this time, and so they've sort of bonded together. And I, as the angel and a being of love, um, I certainly love him. Mm. Does he love me? He wouldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> that would be far too, uh, uh, you know, far too demonstrative. Yeah. Form. The type of relationship it is, Gaiman has left up to fandom in a decision some adore, but other fans resent. There are some who feel the series actually had less nevable husbands for them than the book. This may be for some of the intricacies that could not be directly adapted, perhaps because of some of the shifts in characterization or fanon. The Good Omens fandom and its works have existed for so long, orbiting the source, that for some they have have become part of the work, which impacts how they read it, as the knowledge of these fanons is always there, enriching the text potentially beyond what it would be were they not shippers or involved in fandom. This is neither a positive or a negative, rather it is just an occurrence. The positives and negatives come with how people react to it. In the series fandom, one can find some specific trends of one's own. There is a particular missing scene at the end of episode 6 that has become its own tag, with most making the assumption that post-bus ride, Aziraphale spent the night at Crowley's. There is a role reversal of who is assumes who is discorporated, but mostly they are getting together fix, ending the 6,000 year slow burn, with many focusing on the dynamic of Oblivious Aziraphale and Pining Crowley, though as can also be pining in these. Oblivious Aziraphale is one point where book and series fans differ, as many book fans feel this is a shift, and that Aziraphale was never oblivious but simply less direct, but actually understood Crowley extremely well and would never miss something so huge, while others argue as to whether he's even oblivious in the series, or simply playing it up, as he's not ready to 
acknowledge it yet because of what that means for his relationship with Heaven and how he feels about Heaven and the Great Plan in general. Others note that Crowley is more pessimistic in the adaptation than he is described as in the novel, wherein he is actually said to be an optimist. This fandom is an intriguing blend of newer and older fans, delighting in the boom of fandom and the discovery of pre-existing fandom for those new to it, and some of the works are quite lovingly blended between both canons. This has resulted in different styles of discussion and new headcanons, some along the lines of the usual secret likes or dislikes of characters, Crowley only liking popsicles because he can eat them and hide his tongue and the like, while others are attempting to nail down just what can these two's relationship be classified as, or rather labeled as, which has led to a bit of an argument between a few sects, those who enjoy smut and those who feel this is an asexual relationship, or those who feel this is an ace queer platonic relationship versus a gay romantic relationship. Now, there are multiple reads, and Gaiman has made his stance clear, angels are sexless for one, and whether one is making stuff up, his words, not mine, whether it is feasible or not, it is still making stuff up for one's own enjoyment. So in short, no one has to be right. While some reads may be more feasible than others, people will gravitate to the ones that suit them for a variety of reasons. Some love that this relationship doesn't focus on sex or smut, as so many relationships already do, and that makes this one feel unique and is a good demonstration of other deeply important aspects of a relationship that can oftentimes be glossed over. This is part of why the fic spends so much time exploring the domestic, and also part of the reason for the husband's moniker. It has to do more with acting like a married couple, one that has settled into companionship after being together for quite some time. Others feel that this relationship is so well established they would like to see some smut. Some even explore the concept from a supernatural, well if humans like it, guess we should give it a try angle. Others view this as a more human relationship, while others play more with the angelic and demonic elements. In short, there is no need to force one's headcanons on others, and because one doesn't see it does not mean they dislike the other headcanons, or are informed from a place of negativity. Though especially on Tumblr, certain fans are quick to jump to assumptions of bigotry. Some have gone so far as to call Gaiman homophobic, or claim he is misinterpreting his own work, a claim that has been leveled at numerous authors in the past, or that the entire show is queer baiting. This is as some do not accept the stance that canonically this series is about angels who interact differently than the humans around them, feeling that this is an excuse. However, on the flip side, others feel that the series is based heavily off of their relationship, so no promo containing it would be lying. The question of whether these two feel something more, and more recognizably human as mentioned, is one that is left up to the fans, and to some it doesn't matter nearly as much as how lovingly these two have been adapted, and they don't feel that whatever it is needs to be spelled out. And some feel that they are quite clearly involved in some capacity, that is, dare one say it, ineffable. Though of course mileage varies, and some even have guilt about shipping them because of all this. If one does not enjoy discourse overriding their shipping and prefers a balance in between, Tumblr is a bit of a roulette wheel, as it also showcases some truly glorious art and some very fun fic prompts. Also, this is a smaller segment of the fandom, surrounded by the pre-existing matrix of good omens that has been firmly established, and by how quickly the ship has exploded, as some find it undeniable. Some are even comparing it to Kirk and Spock. These headcanon details can mean a great deal to certain shippers, and increase or decrease their enjoyment, which is understandable. It crosses the line, however, when one feels everyone must adhere to their headcanon, and there will be no answer forthcoming, as Gaiman has made it clear he feels fans should play in their own sandbox, however they like, as it were. And there are fans who enjoy exploring all the different takes and perspectives, and will read anything ineffable, simply thrilled to have options to explore. In fact, for them, that makes the fandom way more interesting. Now, this pairing ship name of ineffable husbands suits them in many ways, for the word means too great or extreme to be expressed or described in words, or not to be uttered, the latter actually having biblical ties. This works because it is hard to describe why fans have come to ship these two, as there is just so much to say, and many find the ship upon them before they even realize what happened, already halfway down the rabbit hole before they have time to question it. Some fans have even said they went in attempting not to ship and came out doing it anyway. But let us make an attempt. These two are set up as creatures who are meant to be adversaries, avatars of good and evil, and yet they find themselves drawn to each other and find an understanding together that is lacking from anyone on their respective or opposing sides. Together they find space to question their natures, to share their love of various aspects of humanity, food, wine, music. They come to appreciate the constant of each other's presence, and the series go out of their way to ensure the safety of the other, with Crowley saving Aziraphale from beheading, as well as a blitz bombing, wherein he also saves his angel's precious books. Many fans point to this as the exact moment you can see Aziraphale realizing just how much he loves Crowley. Crowley is willing to work with Aziraphale's idiosyncrasies and go at his pace, and Aziraphale is there to lift Crowley up and encourage him to move past his occasional bouts of cynicism. The series in particular is full of moments, the statue, the fact that the two share music, even if every CD in Crowley's car is doomed to become a 
Queen tape, though doomed is probably the wrong word for such an awesome occurrence. Unless you hate Queen, that is. There is a normalcy to these two's relationship that many find endearing, identifiable, and desirable. For it is not mundane, but a celebration of the magic of the ordinary. Nights spent drinking wine and planning, lunches together at one's favorite places, walks in the park, small acts of kindness, pet names, the safety to bicker about quirks when is long ago accepted, which differs from fights over real issues. In the series, these two know each other so well they can mimic the other. Though if one watches closely, there are tells where one has a different interpretation of the other's behavior as seen through the other's eyes. Fans have penned many an essay on just why they feel these two work, and they just keep on coming. Others require no explanation. It is simply ineffable, and they love it. But not everyone does. Not every ship is for everyone, or in this case, every work. Not everyone is down for good omens at all. Some find it too blasphemous, or not funny, or trying too hard to be the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. From the days of only the book, some felt it was a reach, and that shippers were simply building upon a friendly foundation to create something that really wasn't there, and in their minds, didn't need to be. Others feel that this relationship is too codependent, a feat as these two at times spend century-long gaps apart. Others feel that it just doesn't work, or that it's anything more than the friendship would be doomed to fall apart. Some also prefer them as friends, as there are always some fans who will prefer a more friendly aspect to a romantic one, and there are some who who want to work within the confines of them being angels, or angel and demon, and what that means in terms of emotions and relationships and love. And some feel that that would translate into something completely different from a traditional romantic relationship. Now, there are some who ship either only the book or series versions, respectively. Some book fans don't like the shift in medium and editions, while others have gone back to the book and have found it to be virtually devoid of shipping comparatively. For many, this ship is undeniable, yet not for them. Not everyone likes a ship, even if they can see it, and the potential in it, which is absolutely fine. Some don't care for one or both of them as characters, and feel Crowley's melodrama would eventually prove too much for the more even-tempered Aziraphale, or that the two would never be able to move at the same speed. This is definitely a fandom where if one doesn't ship them, there's not much else out there in the fic department. It's Inception all over again. Or rather, Inception was Good Omens all over again. Woe unto those few shippers trying to find a match with one of those two with Gabriel. Godspeed. For those shipping these two, do you find a significant difference in characterization between book and series? Did you enjoy the changes the adaptation made? If you don't ship these two, why not? That's not an aggressive why not, but a genuine one. One of the hopes of this channel is to share a variety of perspectives so that those mired in one may see at least the rationale of another. Also, do you need a shippable moments vid? You know the drill. Answer all those, along with anything else you can think of down below. Numbered if possible. I love a good essay comment. Share all of your thoughts down below. Thanks so much for watching. There are as always more videos coming soon. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Special thanks to all my patrons, names on the side, for helping to make these videos possible. I will see you all again when I can, and until then, let's get to that outro, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.